guys it's been a while on this channel but i'm coming to you with some very exciting guest interviews chats collaborations over the next few weeks um because i've been in touch with just some incredible people doing wonderful work in the dance world and i was like it's too good not to share this so here we go and my um first guest is chelsea today i'm gonna let her do a little intro um but we would love to hear from you guys as this episode is going on let us know comments questions um and i hope you enjoyed the episode so chelsea so happy yeah. to have you here thank you for thank doing you this. thank you so much for having me <laughs> i'm excited to chat with you yeah uh, me too we already did a podcast um for Chelsea, which was super fun. And I was like, we have to do this again um, because there's so much wonderful work going on out there. So Chelsea, what's your kind of like background? And then let's get into like what you do now. Sure. So, uh, hi, I I'm Dr. Chelsea Parati. I just, Chelsea is fine. And I, uh, I'm a sports psychologist and, but my background is in all of everything dance world, right? So I was a traditional kind of studio rat, did all of that, uh, you know, the contemporary and ballet and jazz and tap and hip hop and all the things you do growing up in a studio. Uh, and then uh, transitioned into ballet more seriously a little bit later, ended up being a professional ballet dancer for a short time, and then uh, went into coaching. So I've uh, coached within the school system for a uh, about 15 years and uh, now have just moved into consulting. So as a sports psychologist, I'm a college professor. And then I also have kind of a private uh, business helping dancers and dance educators uh, work on all of the mental aspects of our sport. So uh, I love the consulting piece and what that has grown into be because just being able to actually work back with dancers, be in the studios, be in the schools, it's been such a joy to find that piece of my career now. Wow, that was so succinct. I'm just thinking back to our podcast and how long it took me to tell the story. I love that. Let me ask you, let me like dive right into the middle of that. So from dancing professionally, uh, what was the thing that made you switch? Was it like a pull to something more exciting? Was it a push out of the world of professional dance? Because that was like something was going on there. What's the story? Mm. I'd love to hear it. Uh, the stories, it was a little bit of both. So, uh, mm. it was, I was in college and, uh, I made the choice to try to go do a traditional college, uh, as well as dance professionally. And I know, uh, some companies don't even let you do that. Like you have to make the choice either, or, uh, my right. company, was a smaller company at the time, and that was acceptable. And so I was trying to do both, uh, and it worked for two seasons. And then I said, this is too much. I can't do it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, kind of both. I think the the professional world was wonderful in so many ways, um, but I didn't feel the fulfillment anymore. Um, and backtracking a little, couple of years before that, my like junior year in high school, I started teaching uh, what I call baby ballet, but like teaching ballet to like four or five years old. And I just loved the teaching side. And I found myself like, you know, watching my dancers on stage was so much more fun than when I was on stage. And there's kind of that story. I always share that the first time I taught, uh, a young ballet class, I was 16, 17 years old. We have our end of the year show that I'm still in as one of the like senior dancers. And I'm backstage watching the little ones perform and just ooing and aahing over them. And I'm so excited. And then they came off stage and I was supposed to go on for my like senior solo or whatever it was at the time. And I was just hugging them and excited. And the music starts for my solo. And I like forgot that I was even supposed to be on stage. I just that was a huge moment. I was like, Oh, I don't actually care about being on stage so much anymore. Like I love the teaching in the behind. So, but that was still in high school. I went on and did two years of professional, but I just never felt the same like love on stage that a lot of my peers felt like I enjoyed class. I liked being at the bar. I liked the, you know, the physical aspect of it, but I didn't get as excited about being on stage. And there was a big kind of aha of like, if you don't love this, like that's what everybody trains for. <laughs> if you don't love the performance aspect of it. Uh, and I didn't love the competing aspect of it when I was at the studio world. So if that is not thrilling, then 
why keep doing it? Um, so there was kind of the pull away. And then the academic side of me has always been really strong. I just love school. And so that part is like, if I'm going to go on to graduate school, I need to focus and put more time there. So I made the choice to leave the company and focus purely academically and kind of pursue that goal instead. Yeah. Well, I'm so grateful that you did because of all the work that you do now. <laughs> was there a was there a process of like acceptance of that when you had that realization of like, you know what, this doesn't like make me happy, like it make you know, or or it doesn't have that same hold over me as it does some of my peers. This performance part, mm-hmm. um, yeah, was yeah, was there a process of like, and that's totally cool, or was there a thing of like, what's wrong with me, like? Do you remember that kind of like taking those steps away and how you felt doing it? Yeah, I, there was a little bit of a, something's weird. This isn't normal. Uh, but I will say it didn't last very long. I think I had, uh, you know, I got around the end of the season and like thinking about contract renewals and, you know, what was I going to do with it? And I was like, you know what? I don't want to, why don't I want to? And I sat with it for a couple of days being like, okay, am I just burnt out in this moment? Am I just really sore? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, is it a momentary thing or is this what I really want? Um, and it was pretty clear to me right away that I was like, I don't want to do this another season. I don't feel it. And there was, you know, that sense of like, okay, you made it, you have a professional com- contract. Like, why would you walk away? And, uh, but it, yeah, I guess it wasn't a hard transition for me. I really had a quick, like, okay, you know what? I'm proud of myself for doing that. That was really cool and exciting. I'm ready to close that chapter. Mm. Have you always been someone that's been good at listening to your intuition? Yes, which mm. I'm grateful for. And I, I think that's something that I, uh, one of my like core personal values is reflection. And I, oh, I just love always that. kind of been natural about it. And then I've been more intentional as I gotten older. I'm like, oh, that's called reflection. I've always done that, <laughs> but that's what that is. And I've always loved it. And I think I have been good at going with my gut, which is, I'm actually a very analytical person. I have like a science PhD. I'm very analytical. I'm very numbers. I'm very, you know, I want to, um, kind of see the data to make a choice. Uh, so I will still do that. And I will do the pros and cons, or I will weigh things, but ultimately I really do trust. Like if I have a a strong feeling that doesn't have a, you know, data behind it, I will still, I will, I will trust it for sure. I love that. And it's, that's so powerful because I feel like sometimes we get sold the story of like, you have to be one or the other, Mm. like you have to either be like the person who, you know, is, is pure logic and numbers and yeah, the, the list of pros and cons and all that kind of thing. Or you kind of get labeled as the opposite of like someone who, you know, if you are connected with your emotions and what your body's telling you about things, then somehow you're unscientific and, and yeah. like some kind of emotional crazy woman or whatever. But right. I love that you, you literally bring those two together. And not only do you bring the two together, but you said, if one has to win, it's going to be the intuition. Yeah. I, so you're so right. And I actually thinking about what you just said, I battled that in myself a lot. Um, cause I felt like I wasn't, well, I guess when I was younger, especially in like studio world, my kind of more science analytical brain would get me in trouble. So, um, I don't know if it like translates for everyone, but for me, I'm also really good at counting and numbers. I hear counts and music very easily compared to some people. And so, uh, if my, you know, choreographer or something was not counting the way just, you know, either they were interpreting it differently or they were just flat out wrong. of <laughs> like, this is not <laughs> that time. Um, yeah. I, I got to a place where I was like, I was confident and I would say it. And then I would get in trouble or I would get, you know, it's not like, don't talk back to me kind of stuff. And, um, I was told I was too smart for my own good. I mean, I just had that, like that more analytical side of me got me in trouble. And I was like, okay, I'm not supposed to be like that as a dancer. I'm supposed to be purely artistic and in tune with my emotions. And, uh, so that I had a hard time with it. I had to shut it down some, um, but it also, it did get in my way. And some of the like more, emotional aspects of performance. Like that was hard for me to tap into. I wanted, had to not try to take a logical approach. I'm like, okay, what am I feeling about this music and this routine? And how do I channel that? Uh, that was harder for me to train for sure. 
Wow. I relate to every single word of that. And I haven't heard someone else particularly articulate it in such a way that is like, so that is so how I felt as well. Isn't that so interesting? This thing of how to marry those two things together and try and engage equally this like logical part and analytical part and also seeing the value of looking at dance through a scientific lens and there's huge value in that and I don't know about you it sounds like maybe there was a bit of this but that there I at least experienced some resistance to that from some parts of the dance world like no no you don't analyze this dance is all about how it feels and what it's meaning and all that thing and I also had I mean I still do sometimes have uh diff- it depends what dance style it is but this difficulty of like allowing myself to really go there emotionally through the movement because I want it to be correct more than yes. I want it to be emotional <laughs> yes yeah and I had to find you know my own balance of like what are my strengths and if I I could analyze a routine to the deeper level of figuring out okay if I keep you know, my weight is off in this section. What am I doing to make that happen? And how do I fix that? So I'm not off balance in the turn. Like I would dig in and analyze it. And then my peers would take a purely kind of emotional piece to it. And, you know, what am I feeling in this moment? And how do I change the expression to make sure that that's what the judges are seeing or what the audience feels. And sometimes it worked to our advantage because we could come together on it. Right. We could help each other with it. Um, But oftentimes we both came to, a positive conclusion. We just got there differently yes. and, and yes. they both worked and they were both, uh, you know, both successful in being able to execute the choreography, but yeah, our approach to it was very different. And, uh, it, it took me a while to be okay with my approach when it, it felt like I was the only one doing it. And I probably wasn't, but you know, in that adolescent brain of I'm the only one yeah. who thinks like this, <laughs> no one so understands I me. felt like I was, <laughs> no one else understands. No one else does it like this. I thought it was more by myself. I probably wasn't as alone as I felt. Um, but it's, it's, it felt like a very unique approach to what, how other, many other dancers felt, um, and didn't, like I said, have that kind of science lens to it. It's such an important point as well. This idea of like, there's more than one way to get to a great outcome. Like yeah. this was something that for the longest time, because I really have had and I've worked on them, but they still come up like a lot of perfectionist tendencies around wanting things to just be one way because then there's just one answer and then I can just find it and be right and no one can question me. Like that was my right. place of safety. Um, but but this idea that, yeah, even, even in a performance or really in anything in life, what I've realized is that there's nearly always more than one way to get to a certain place and it might look different but we don't always have to be judging the, the opposite side <laughs> of yes. the other one. So I'm really curious how then from your training and things, you got into more of the mindset piece, the yeah. mental side of it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sort of accidentally. So um, I always share kind of with my college students now who are mostly uh, juniors and seniors who are in the, like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. And I'm, you know, they're stressing about graduating college and not knowing what's next. And I was, I was like, I had no idea either. And my advice is always to just follow the next thing that's exciting and interesting to you, even if you don't know what the outcome is. And it stems from a much more eloquently said quote, that's a Martin Luther King Jr. quote to something of the effect of like, you don't have to see the top of the staircase to take the first step. And as a you know, 20 something. I was like, I don't, I need to know the end goal. And then I can get there. I need to know what I'm trying to do. And I, I didn't know what that was. And I had a hard time figuring it out. And I don't like not having a plan. (laughs) It's like, I need a plan, but anyway, I didn't have one. So I just kept pursuing things that were exciting and interesting. So, uh, I have a master's degree in a more clinical area of psych that I turns out I didn't like that much. Uh, but it was Mm. what I thought was the next step coming out of a psychology undergraduate degree. And that was, uh, when I was coaching. So I had trans in the dance side of me was, uh, I found coaching and I loved that. And I started to see the parallels between coaching and teaching. And that part of my life was wonderful. The psych part of my life was on more of a clinical track that I turns out, as I said, I didn't really like. So I had all of a sudden this place of 
well, now I don't know what to do. Uh, and mm. I always felt like the sport side and the psych side were very different and didn't go together. They were just going to be my two passions and that's okay. I will keep doing both. Uh, but then when I was finished my master's realized clinical was not what I wanted. I took a year of, you know, the exploration and the lots of reflection <laughs> and trying to figure out what do I like and what do I want? Uh, and then I actually discovered sports psychology as a field. I didn't realize it even was a field uh, when I was a lot younger. And so uh, that discovery made everything click that I realized everything about coaching and psychology, like that there is a field that does both. Uh, and so that just, it, it felt like that, you know, the puzzle piece, everything clicked right away. I was like, this is exactly what I was meant to do. So then started, uh, uh, that PhD program. I loved everything about it from the science and the academic side, but it's, uh, really opened my eyes to all of the mental stuff and talking more about, you know, the self-talk and confidence and motivation and the team building and leadership stuff. And, uh, everything about that program, uh, just kept clicking. I was coaching the whole time as well. So I was able to still kind of see the cross and it's just evolved from there, but it was, yeah, it stemmed out of a a long year of, I don't know what the heck I want to do and trying to find the right thing. That was a very uncomfortable year. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, led me to, to find the right path. Yeah. I so think there's a lot to be said for sitting in the messy middle and it's really uncomfortable. I think especially as dancers, cause you don't ever want anything to be messy and any of the things that you do, but there's, um, ultimately freedom on the other side of that messy middle there's something else that you you mentioned in your story that I wanted to ask you about so um would you would you feel comfortable to tell us about why from your perspective the clinical side wasn't like calling to you as much as you thought it would and sure. it seems like again in that moment and please correct me if I'm wrong that there was again like the logical part might have been like, this is the correct next step because this is what's mm -hmm. expected or whatever. And then something intuitively as you were doing that was like, this is not quite right for me. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm fascinated by like that part of the story. Absolutely. Oh, you're totally right. There was that battle again. Uh, so I think when I finished my undergrad in psych, it was really, I knew I wanted graduate school. That has been a thing since I was a young child. I knew I wanted to keep going. I've always loved academia. And I was like, that's, that part wasn't a question. It was in what, right. and then in psych, I thought kind of clinical ish in that arena was the only option. And so, uh, it was specifically, it was actually forensic psychology, which is psychology and the law. And I loved it academically. I loved reading about it and researching it. And it was very interesting. But as I went through the program, uh, it was back to the intuition piece of, I loved the classroom aspects of it. I loved the discussions. I loved, again, the reading and the case studies. Uh, but part of my program had uh, internships, basically, where we got to kind of do the work uh, as we were going through. And it comes again in the reflection of, I was like, okay, I like being in the classroom. I like the conversations. I, I like having somebody make me think about this differently. But then I go on Friday and actually do all the clinical work with the, with this population. And I don't like it. And mm. that was really hard for me because I was like, I, this is, I'm training to get out of school and go do the thing. If I don't like the thing, what am I doing? And, uh, so as you were saying, the logical next step, I had applied for clinical PhD programs and then throughout towards the end of my master's. And I was like, I don't like doing the work. So I would enjoy the next few years of my doctoral program, but then what, <laughs> if I don't actually like it, what do I do? And I thought it was the only option. And it was again, like the logical next step, this is what you're supposed to do. Uh, and it was a hard intuition. I have a the vivid memory of one night, just bawling and just like basically mourning what I thought my future was. Uh, and am I going to regret this? And can I go back if I change my mind? And uh, my husband at, the, um, I don't know if, this is right around when we get married. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> husband or the fiance at the time, whatever, he was so supportive and wonderful, uh, just letting me lose it <laughs> and not know what to do. And be like, it's going to be okay. Like, we'll figure out what's next. And you always land on your feet kind of conversation. Um, so I actually withdrew all of my, I had applied to clinical PhDs and I withdrew them all. Cause I said, if you, I was worried if they got, if I got in that, I wouldn't say no. 
that I would, yeah. it was like, never mind, just don't even tell me. <laughs> I don't want to know. I'm going to withdraw it all. And that's when I sat in the messy middle for a year trying to figure out what to do. Um, and it was interesting where I think the, the path of teaching was there, but I didn't see it because I was so focused on the next right step that I've always thought was next, right. Following that trajectory. Um, but I had a, a professor in my master's that was to this day is still a wonderful mentor. Uh, and I, she told me that I could, should consider being an educator. And when she said it, I was like, no way. I never wanted to be a teacher. That was not in my, like my wheelhouse. Yeah. I teach ballet, but you know, it was not a professional endeavor that I had ever considered. And when I sat in that messy middle, I was like, what do I really enjoy? I'm like, I liked class. I liked the conversations. I liked the research. I was like, guess, well, there actually is a job where you get to stay in school and just do that all the time. And it's being a professor. And when I finally had that click, it was like this big weight lifted. I was like, oh, there is a job where the things I truly loved about this are there and I can be fulfilled in that piece. But it was, uh, like I said, the one night of a lot of mourning of what was, I was giving up and then a year of now, what the heck do I do? And feeling really uncomfortable, uh, but then finding that specific program and feeling it all click of like, that's exactly what this is supposed to be. Wow. Oh my goodness. Like that's so powerful because at some point as well is the permission to look at something that was right in front of you the whole time. Like you had been a student, so you had seen professors literally like right in front yeah. of you, but there wasn't a moment until something switched where you were like, oh, that what if that was me and like yeah. isn't it so interesting that it's these small moments in life where just like something shifts and you give yourself permission to look at yourself in a different way that you yeah. hadn't thought you were allowed to or that wasn't Absolutely. on your path that all of a sudden like opens up yeah the doors it is and I am so I've told this professor multiple many times uh, as I said <laughs> she's still in my life and I was like she wrote a comment on the bottom of a feedback. I don't know. I did a presentation for something and she wrote it on the bottom, you know, think you should think about being an educator. And I was like, you literally changed my path because I needed her to open that door for me. I didn't see it at all. Um, but again, I had been coaching almost 10 years by then and I love coaching. And then I, when I finally started to realize, I was like, oh, the things I love about coaching are exactly why I would love teaching. <laughs> like, those are so yeah. this insane wheelhouse. And when I finally saw that uh, saw that connection and realized dance and academia could actually continue to go together, uh, that it was that big light bulb, but there was a lot of messy middle before that, that yeah, was uncomfortable, but I'm grateful for it still. Yeah. Do you know what's so beautiful about that part of your story as well is that obviously you are an incredible woman. You you're very intelligent. You're very driven, like all of these things and still mm -hmm that it required some support along that part of the path. Oh, absolutely. And this is something I love, like reminding us as the dance community that like you had your husband there to hold you through the emotional difficulty. Mm -hmm. And then you also had someone else seeing your own potential that in that moment wasn't necessarily obvious to you. And yes. so I just love to remind myself and everyone else that we're allowed to receive support in this journey as well. And not only are we allowed to, it's important to. It is. Oh, that's, you're so right. And there's been many people key in various age, stages of my life, you know, at the younger me, my mom and my sister, as I got older, the, my husband, my, and my family is still close, uh, the master's mentor. And then as I kept going, my doctoral mentor is still a woman who has made a huge impact and been a big support. Uh, and because in the world of social psychology or sport psychology, it used to be very focused on kind of traditional sport. So all the research is in like football, basketball, rugby, baseball, you know, all of that. Looking at it from a performance aspect as we would in dance was right. relatively new. And now thankfully it's really grown. But at the time and I was like, I want to research this and dance as a performance, not even the competitive side. Um, and I actually mm -hmm. ended up looking at like dancers who do both. Cause many of us do both. Uh, and my doctoral mentor was like, I love it. This is amazing. Like let's, she allowed me to explore an area that was new and exciting and supported it, um, uh, that I know not a lot of mentors would do. They would just have you do their work. Right. And right. she was another one that just let me find and explore what was unique to me. And I needed that support at the time to say this, this idea is not crazy. Like this is good. Let's try it. 
Yeah, that's so awesome. It's so nice that you've just taken time there to like recognize all the people that have helped you oh, along the way. I think so yeah, many it's amazing so people. beautiful to do that. Yeah. What came out of that research? I'm really curious. Like, were there findings that you were like would be happy to share right now with the people yeah. who are listening or uh, watching? Yeah. So let's see. So my my specific doctoral research was on leadership. So I was looking at uh peer leaders. So in a sport world, when we call them captains, right? Like the juniors or seniors that are leading a school team. Um, but then it was also kind of informal leaders like studios don't necessarily have a captain, but you have the dancers that everyone looks to, right? The dancers that have the lead roles, the dancers that are more, um, more experienced, more talented, you know, whatever it is that the hierarchy creates <laughs> within the studios. Um, but I kind of looked at leadership qualities, uh, in, um, school teams specifically, and was looking at how, athletes, like how they perceived their captains and if their captain's leadership styles impacted their sense of cohesion. So if how the leaders were treating their teammates essentially, and how they went about leading, if it made the team closer. And so it was really interesting because not a lot of work had been done in high school. Mostly it was with college and professional athletes. And I was looking at just high school girls, uh, and, and I did that on purpose. There were men in the, and, you know, high school boys in some of the teams, but for the sake of research, it's easier to keep it tight. So, uh, I just looked at high school girls and if they were different than, um, college and a lot of that research was on college men and it, it is very different. And so mm. I guess to your question, the girls, high school girls really wanted peer leaders who were social support and who were um, encouraging. They don't want the high, the leaders that are like the teacher and the instructor. Uh, they That's what the coach is. And the peer leader is someone who is much more in the social piece and much more in the um, caring about you as a person, not as a dancer. And when the leaders did that, there was a tighter cohesion with the team uh, where uh, like college men, pro athletes actually feel differently about it. And so it was neat to kind of say how women are unique, and then high school is unique and being able to uh, think about leadership differently. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's so interesting. I love to, yeah. Just thinking now, as you were saying that it's so true that in different moments and from different people, we need different styles of leadership and then yeah. asking ourselves like, huh, what kind of leader do I want to show up as, as a teacher or when I'm not a teacher, but I'm in a dance class is maybe one of the ones that people look up to. And then, well, right. what about as a coach? And yeah, fascinating, yeah. like self-reflection exercise. Like what kind of leader am I in the different areas of my life? Yeah. Um, well, what kind yeah. of leader are you? Uh, so I guess it depends on where I am in the moment. And I think mm. that's uh, the beauty of it is helping younger dancers figure out when they are like their first leadership role, maybe they are assisting in a class or their, you know, things they, we try to be our favorite leader. We try to be like, whoever we look up to, I want to do what they did. Um, and that often doesn't work because it, one, it may not actually be your position at the time. You are an assistant and they need, you know, the social piece or they, you're a captain, you're, you are still in the team. You're not the separate leader yet. Um, or we just try to emulate other people and just in general in life that never works, right? You have to be true to yeah. you and not being someone else, but most leaders, and I definitely did that the first few years coaching. I just tried to emulate all my favorite coaches and be them until I could finally figure out who am I and what do I really value and what I, what do I care about? Um, so now my, I guess my leadership style in, in academia, it's called the more democratic style of, um, the athletes have a voice caring about what they have to say, asking for their opinion. Uh, they don't always get to override. Like sometimes I'm still the, the last you know, last authority, the last say, but, um, hearing from them, asking them how they, what they think about what they feel about things. Um, including a lot of that, still having the social support, having the room for the emotional piece. Um, but I really believe in challenging our athletes and that they will rise to the occasion. And I think that's been a, a shift in kind of where my consulting work has gone is that in our move, in our mental health awareness and the movement that that has been lately, which I'm so grateful for. And we have so much work to do <laughs> to keep, uh, that piece moving in athletics, but it has made a lot of coaches and dance teachers, I think, scared to challenge our athletes. Like, mm -hmm. I can't push them too hard because I'm going to hurt them. And we don't want that. Of course, I don't want to damage our athletes. Um, and so 
trying to find that balance. And I think a lot of my work now has been trying to help dance teachers. Like you can still set a hard bar. You can still push them. You can still have a really high expectations of them, but you don't have to, you know, beat them down in order to build them back up. Kind of the old ballet approach to things that you can do it in a much more supportive way. So I've, it was a long-winded around of what my leadership style is, but getting to trying to balance those two things and then helping others see that you can do that. There's not, you don't have to just be the warm and fuzzy or just be the drill sergeant. Like there is a way to um, have the better aspects of both. Yes. Oh my goodness. This is so, so important. And something that I figured out in, in a messy way myself, just through trial and error. <laughs> of right. like, what's the best way to show up for my, and for me, it was adult students. And exactly as you said, it is like, if I've ever erred on either side, it's usually been like overly challenging. That's just my, that, that's like my personality, yeah. I guess. But but giving the space for the feedback and not having that threaten me as a teacher right. and understand that this is highly productive for everyone. Um, and yeah, receiving that feedback and knowing that there will be places that I can do better. And if I can do better, it doesn't mean that I failed. It just means that I'm learning and all these kinds of things. But yes. also a, the really big piece of what you just said as well is like, um, you know, I see now, especially online with some of the you know, it's so hard on social media, you know, reading a post and, uh, and something and trying to take something from that little snippet. And I, I get the sense that some dance teachers are be becoming scared now that like, what if I hurt them? What if I don't do this perfectly? What if it's not 100% safe and, and coming from this place of fear now showing up in the studio? And yeah, just wanting to be this like soft and fuzzy, hot, holding them like this. But at the same time, you're still a leader. So you're not only a mother in the studio, you also have to be a leader. So I love yeah. that you said that. And for me, the piece that helped at least me with that from my time in the studio is empowering the students because I can ask you for something. But as long as you know that you're the limits of your body only you know I as a teacher can only know what I see I can't know what's going on on the inside for you and I guess yeah. that's easier to do with adults you know it's very easy to just you know say you're a great team come on you know what's going on and I trust you to know what's going on with your body and if I'm asking for something that's too much please tell me and being mm -hmm. comfortable with that as well um yes. but this part of about the empowerment then allows you to be like it's a healthy challenge then rather than something I'm demanding from you right yeah. It's that autonomy piece is a huge part of how you work it together. And it is, it's harder to explain it to the younger dancers, but you can still obviously keep it as a part of your classes and helping them, you know, like I am going to set this bar. I'm going to push you because I believe you're capable of it. If yeah. you choose to fight for that is up to you. Like, I'm not going to force that and like do that's where the harm comes in. Right. With the, yeah. whether it be physical harm or emotional harm of forcing you, but you can, but I think our dancers also need to hear that. I believe you're capable of this next level. I, so that's 100%. where we're at. That's why this combination is so hard. That's why this choreography is so challenging. That's why we're moving on to this new scale, or I chose a really difficult piece of music because I believe you are capable of it. So I think that instills again, that beginnings of a growth mindset and like that you are capable of rising to this challenge. Um, but then it's not you know, it's supporting them alongside their own journey to push themselves, not being the one behind them and being the one who's forcing that to happen, but allowing it to be the intrinsic desire of like, okay, she believes I can do this. Maybe I can't maybe, and helping them make those small incremental pieces of progress, like celebrating the progress along the way, not just the outcomes and kind of ways that you can help push them through to reach that higher bar and keep moving it and keep setting it high and helping them reach those expectations, even if they are not believing in themselves. Yeah, I mean, it's so powerful. And I feel like this kind of external motivation has been somewhat like demonized over the last few <laughs> years. I don't know if, you don't, if you've seen this, it might just be the weird circles that I run in. But <laughs> there's, been, there's been so much focus on like inner motivation, which is super important. Like that, th th there's no, you know, two ways about that. But there's also nothing wrong with that external motivation of like, hey, like I see you're capable of this. Like, let me 
push you a bit to get there or like encourage you to get there or whatever word we want to use there but that's super valuable too like we shouldn't remove that part and just be like any dancer should be able to um you know reach any challenge purely from willpower alone like I don't think that's realistic (laughs) I agree yeah and getting (laughs) getting slightly academic on you and I won't I promise I'll keep it Rain it no, in. I love but, it. Bring it um, on. Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> From a motivation point of view, when we study motivation, uh, it's there's one kind of well, there's many overarching theories. One of them that is used a lot is called self determination theory, and there's these three components of uh, helping us be the most kind of basically self-determined, meaning intrinsic. Like, how much do I want to be motivated is coming from within. And those three things that we can do, one is autonomy. So if we, if we feel autonomous, if we feel like, okay, I have some choice about what I'm doing, uh, that's going to foster that intrinsic motivation. So keeping that, uh, alive in your classes. And then, uh, one is relatedness. If you feel a connection, if you feel Mm. like you are with people who care about you, uh, that's going to enter, that's going to improve the intrinsic part. And that's where the warm fuzzy matters. That's where it's like, no, I care about you as a human, not just the trick that you can pull off. Like I, that piece will, will foster again, the intrinsic. I want to work hard because I, my peers care about me. My teachers love me. I want to be here for them. So that'll boost the intrinsic. And then the third one is competence. If you feel like you're capable you're going to be more motivated. And again, that's where the, I believe in you. I believe you are capable of more is really fostering the competence. You are actually improving their intrinsic natural desire. Um, And it's not just the purely extrinsic, you know, carrot on the end of the stick, do this thing and you get this reward. It's helping them find the intrinsic. So it really is still focused on that internal motivation. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Thank you. I did. I hadn't seen how those are, interlinked but it makes yeah. perfect sense yeah, yeah that's amazing um what's exciting you at the moment like either in in the re- research or how you're working with people what's something that's like present for you right now that you're excited about oh wow um, I know it's such a big question <laughs> right what am I excited about right now I I I think I'm starting to maybe believe in my own competence more if that's a mm. thing of like feeling like, okay, no, I'm really stepping into the, the consulting side and the speaking side. And I've been doing it for a long time, but it's finally like, okay, I, I do, I, I do have something new to offer. I do have something unique. And again, it's the perfectionist it's the dancers. It's like, I don't want to put this out there until I feel like it's perfect. Yeah. And I had to get through that of like, this is continuing to evolve and it's getting it gets better every time I do a workshop with the studio, it gets better every dancer I talk to and every coach who's a part of my memberships. And so being able to see, I'm excited, I guess, to see that the iterations that keep coming. Um, and what, I guess what's been exciting more on like a big picture is just how much people are embracing and accepting, uh, the mental aspects of a sport and, and that it belongs in dance and it belongs in our education. Um, and, because it is still unique from mental health and like mental health and mental toughness are not the same thing. And it's, we need both. And I, I think I'm getting, what I'm excited about is I have, there's less explaining around that. And there's more acceptance of like, Oh yeah, we need that. We want that. Please come and help. Uh, So where years ago I had to spend a lot more time just explaining what I do and why you need it and convincing people that they needed it. And now it's much more uh, accepted and understood and people are reaching out for it, which that's so exciting to see a shift in our culture that talking about mental health and mental toughness is a, as a part of being a dancer is just as important as you would bring in strength training and nutrition and all these other aspects of um, being a successful dancer. So I love seeing that shift. That's been probably the most exciting piece. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's so wonderful to hear that like that's already happening at this level yeah. and people are now seeking you out rather than you've been like hey this is what I do this is how it can help I guess yeah. it's still a mixture of both but it's so powerful and it's something that I'm I'm like in that like question in the middle of the question yeah. right now with the coaching thing because I feel like in some, I don't know if this is a fair comparison at all, but there's something where people are really understanding like what therapy is and understanding that side of things of like helping us 
it's almost like um heal that part's the healing mm -hmm. but then there's like coaching which might include small aspects of that but it's really about like realizing the potential and building resilience in yeah. your life and like reaching for new things and striving so it's like these are two complementary things almost yeah. like the mental health and the mental toughness so um that's really exciting that you just said <laughs> that because hopefully this also like comes out into the wider world yeah. and people understand that like yeah I'm allowed to keep setting big goals for myself and big goals for my life and I'm allowed yeah. to receive support through that process right. um you said about leaning into your competence can I ask you like as a last thing for the people who are listening because I know so many highly skilled highly competent dance teachers dancers people who maybe work in some kind of coaching capacity in the dance world who are so competent but it's still that thing of like I don't want to step into it yet what yeah. did you do Chelsea <laughs> give us some uh, clues <laughs> absolutely uh I th it's it's taking small actions and there's a whole it's rooted in acceptance and commitment therapy for anybody who's in like that, the more pure psych side of things or therapy side, I should say. Uh, but bringing it into uh, sports psychology, being able to flip that mental switch from the, the negative thoughts, I'm not good enough, I can't do this, what if I mess it up? And switching into taking a small action that will move you towards your goals because we can't always positive talk our way out of it. Right? Mm. And that's hard to do, but you can take a small action. You can go ahead and record the podcast and record the video. You can go ahead and teach the class that scares you. You can, you know, just taking some small action and then practice being acceptance of being accepting of the feedback that comes with it. And I think mm. many of us, as you said, with, as teachers, like we get to a place where I, I love the feedback as a teacher. I want my students to tell me about it. And I had to take that lens to this new endeavor. I'm like, nope, this is, and I, it's not new now, but at the time. I had to take like, okay, I'm new to this. I don't know how to do this yet. And it's been a while since I've done something. I don't know how to do it all. And that's okay to sit in the, this is new. I don't know how to do it yet. I want the feedback. And the only way to do that is to like put it out there and take some sort of small action. So I think the, the how to do it when you are questioning your own competence is to take a small baby step. Um, when we get stuck in the, I have to read one more thing. I have to listen to one more. I need to sit with this idea a little bit longer. And when you've been sitting in the thoughts too long, it's not going to go anywhere. And being able to, uh, one small step will like keep the additive effect will get you out of it eventually. And I still have to do it. It's not, I mean, I, I still have to convince myself to take another small step whenever I have something big and scary that I want to try. Um, but that's the continued pattern. Absolutely. I totally have the same process. It's like the time for it. And like, sometimes it's not, at least I find like there are moments in my life where it, I just don't have the emotional capacity to hold another one of those steps. So I'm just kind of like cruising for a bit. I just went through something a little bit difficult in my marriage. I'm on the other side of that of it now, but like now I feel ready again to do another yeah. one of those steps of like, sending a really scary like message to someone asking that I think like they might not want to talk to me but let me just see or whatever it is the next step right. of the thing that I'm like am I ready for this and when I have that question I'm like if I'm asking that question there's a part of me that is otherwise I wouldn't even be asking it because I know right. myself I would just be like that's way too far off um <laughs> and like yeah it's a practice though, isn't it? It's not something that you do a few times and then you're like, right, I did all the, I did all the baby steps. Now I'm ready for the big thing. And I'm always going to feel like I'm right. I know everything that I'm doing, but yeah. it's like part of the process. Well, especially because obviously I think, and you and I align on this, that like, I'm never done. I have, yes. I'm always going to have something else big that I want to do. Like I have, this is, <laughs> I just paused. Cause I was like, I haven't spoken the words out loud very much, especially publicly, but this is the small step, right? There we go. I, I really want to write a book and I've had this vision of what that's going to be, but I keep, I'm like, I can't talk about it yet. I don't, this is probably a five-year dream. That's okay. And, but I'm still going to do something that's scary. There's always going to be something else. And so, but you're right. It's practice. If I can keep practicing, keep doing the little steps, keep doing the thing and recognizing like, yeah, we can do really hard, scary things and keep keep doing it. And it, it does get easier to do the scary thing the more you do it, mm -hmm. but you just have so to keep true. doing it. It doesn't go so away. True. Yeah. And then there's the next level. I feel like it's that, like that ballet meme 
that's like ballet doesn't get easier you just get better or something like that right. like yeah, it's always absolutely. something hard to do <laughs> yes absolutely <laughs> yeah amazing did we miss anything that was important to you that you feel like your heart needs to share? <laughs> oh, we, I feel you, like that was such you. a you've fun been, conversation. Yeah. yeah, you've been so open. Thank you so much. I love your journey. I, I actually wasn't expecting how much I resonate with all of it. And, you know, I want to just say, because you just shared that about the book, like, I would love to read your book. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I would love like you have so much knowledge and wisdom to share and I know you're already doing that in so many ways but it would be super cool to have it in book format too thanks. it is <laughs> so that's my big vision board that. thing as I said <laughs> it's probably years away but that's the big vision board thing that you just keep taking the small steps we'll get there eventually I don't know I have yeah. no idea what it'll look like but <laughs> it'll happen right we have the positive talk <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, you've, it's in the universe now. So something uh, similar or not that exact thing, but similar will happen. Um, yeah. Chelsea, how can people find you? How do you like to work with people? Yeah, let people know yeah. what you are. Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, if I guess one of the easiest ways to kind of get into my community and hear more about what I do is my podcast. So it's called Passion for Dance. And I bring in kind of four pillars of the mental aspects of sport, always within the context of dance. So I'll cover either mindset, motivation, resilience, or community. So usually the community means I bring in a guest as Natalie was with me recently, and it was such a great conversation around community and dance. And uh, so there's that piece, or I have shorter solo episodes with advice on uh, motivation, all the mindset things um, and resilience. So that's, yeah, passion for dance, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and otherwise I'm on Instagram all the time too. So happy to chat there. It's uh, Parati. Uh, which we may need to link. My last name is a challenge, but that's okay. We'll have everything linked in the description, guys. <laughs> Just click underneath the video and it'll all be yeah. there. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, that would be, I'd love to chat anytime. Please reach out and connect. I love that's the community is what makes dance so special. I love being a part of it. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. This has been yeah. such a pleasure. Guys, let us know if you enjoyed this episode and I will be back soon with another guest. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.